Everybody and welcome back to another episode of Translating Love. I'm Voifi. And I'm Danny. Hi, Danny. Hi, Voifi. <laughs> We're back with a new episode, everybody. And this one is an exciting one. It is. Because we finally got Danielle's other dad on the podcast. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Wrong note. Other mom, I should say. Only mom. Oh, only mom. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and she's already with us. She is. So we can welcome Patty. Patty Steiner. To the podcast. Thank you. I didn't know that you were going to say I was already with you, so I had to like keep trying not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> That's how funny we are. Yes, you People are. People have to. <laughs> People have to restrain themselves from laughing because yeah. <laughs> we're so hysterical. No, I am. Oh. I see. I do have no, to say, when I listen to your podcast, I do laugh more often at Wifey. Yeah, he see? he tends to have the more, see? but it's only because your brain is, is so like outrageous and random. If, I don't have such word, a random brain. The word you're searching for is genius. <laughs> it's not the word I'm searching for. I, I was thinking more like it's sort of like middle school boy humor that just yeah. is totally yeah. my thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 for some reason, my brain, my brain stopped developing at that age. <laughs> my brain was like, oh, "I like it here. I stop." <laughs> I'm comfortable. <laughs> I don't need. I don't need to grow more. It's fine. <laughs> so, but uh, let's get to the serious things. We're back with a new episode, and we have Patty here because. Are you waiting for me to yeah. say? Yeah. Um, well, we thought that it would be interesting to have. Another take on trauma, um, but to show kind of like, an, I mean, we try to talk positively about the after effects of trauma, like mm -hmm. moving on from it. But I think that my mom is a really great example of all of the lovely things that, that can happen after you experience a like a pretty massive trauma. Mm -hmm. And so we thought that it would be interesting to hear her story a little bit. You have an interesting story. Maybe go like i mean we talked a little bit about your story once in, in a few episodes mm -hmm. just like give a little hints and give a little like um because we talked about my accident and stuff and i think we mentioned yours too but maybe maybe uh briefly talk about your accident and what happened and um why it happened okay um so my accident was um the year the summer after i graduated from high school And I lived in a small town, lots of long country roads. I, uh, at that point in my life, was drinking way too much and hanging out with people who drank way too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, the accident happened one night when I was out with a girlfriend. And I'm just going to say Mary because I don't want to use her actual name. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Mary and I went out and we were at a bar And um, I decided that I wanted to go to another bar that was about, I don't know, five miles down the road because there was a guy there that I wanted to see. And so um, a friend of mine, um, let, he took me on his motorcycle to go to the other bar five miles down the road. And Mary stayed at the bar she was at. And this is just so weird coincidence because I'm talking about country roads, no lights, two lanes, Nothing in sight, no houses. You see farms in the background, but it's pretty, you know, um, isolated. And um, I, the guy that I was hoping to see at the other bar wasn't there, so we turned around and were heading back to where Mary was. And at the same time, Mary was heading to us to see <laughs> what the heck I was doing. And um, she had been, she had a, a pretty serious drinking problem. And she had, um, she was really drunk, and uh, I was certainly in no condition to be on a motorcycle, and the boy that was um, driving the motorcycle was in no condition. But she hit me, so we're, you know, go going in opposite directions. I mean, we're going toward each other, and I never saw her, um, but I was on the back of the motorcycle. She had a very large car. She crossed over the line, 
and hit only my left leg. So if you think about when you're sitting on a motorcycle, your knees are sort of out from the bike. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She hit my leg and my knee and threw me up and off of the bike. And she, she didn't even touch uh, the bike or the wow. driver. He, in fact, went 100 yards or so before he realized I was off. Whoa. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> and the interesting thing also about that night is that um, vanity, I, I like to say vanity saved my life because I never wore a helmet. But it was raining a little bit that night. So I had put the helmet on so that my hair would look good. <laughs> 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 and uh, so, I mean, I don't remember. This is kind of the, the beauty, I think, of at least something that's comforting to tell people who maybe lost somebody to an accident is that when you're in the process of it, at least in my case, it's it's not this horrific thing yet. Um, mm-hmm. I actually, I don't have any recollection of the impact or of even seeing her car approaching me. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. The first thing I remember is that I was rolling. And I mean rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm rolling. I wonder, <laughs> wonder when this is going to stop. And it really was just like that. It was just like, huh, hmm. I'm rolling. I wonder when I'm going to stop. And then the next thing I remember is um, there's a woman standing over me, and she's covered me with a blanket. But right before she puts the blanket on me, and I'm laying in a cornfield, and it's, it's now raining good. And um, I looked down at my leg, and there was so much blood that I thought at that moment that it was gone. I was sure it was gone. And then you go into shock. And, and then I remember mm. this woman putting the blanket over me. And I learned later that the boy who was driving the motorcycle, once he realized I was gone, he came back. And then he broke into the closest farmhouse, those poor people, you know, in the middle of the <laughs> night. I mean, this is probably 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, and somebody's breaking into your house. And uh, all I remember about her is how grateful I was for her because she just kept telling me, you're going to be okay, you're going to be okay. Um, and... Uh, they uh, they took me to my my dad was in the navy and so they took me to the local navy hospital and they are, are cutting my clothes off and somebody drops one of those IVs on my head and at that time <laughs> they weren't plastic bags it was like a jar <laughs> she oh, drops on my head <laughs> um, and I had I had lots wrong with me I had uh, my my leg was ripped open from basically the ankle all the way up the front to the knee and then halfway up the thigh, wow. just open wound all the way down. What, what year was that? That was 1982. And uh, I, my pelvic bone was broken in half and I had a collapsed lung and lots of other lacerations. And so um, I remember when I was in the hospital, um, the first Navy hospital, they called my dad uh, and they didn't tell him what was wrong. They just said, you know, your daughter has been in an accident. I think they told him I had a broken leg. <laughs> and so I remember him walking into the hospital room and just the shock on his face because that's not what he was expecting to see. In fact, he took the time to put his uniform on because he was just like, ah, I guess I'll just get dressed for work, you know, just go see if she's okay and then go to work. Um, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so then they put me in a helicopter and flew me to Bethesda Naval Hospital. And I spent three months there with them trying to salvage my leg. Uh, and then they finally said, uh, after three months, you can, uh, we can amputate your leg or you can agree to go through a series of 10 different surgeries over a period of years. And each surgery has like a 20% success rate. I mean, it was just like you could get to number 10 and end up still having to have the leg amputated. So wow. the 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 three months in at the hospital, they did they do some surgeries or was it just like trying to see and wait? Um, no, they what they did is a, a procedure that's called debridement, which is just god awful. Um, what? Yeah, you told me about that. Yeah, it's uh, so every two times a day, um, they they take so they take you out of so. Your leg is packed, and and I'm talking like when I say gouged, I mean down to the bone, all the way down the length of the leg. And so what they do is they pack it with like this gauze, and then twice a day they take you and they put you in this big tub of hot warm water, 
and you get to sit there for a minute while the gauze kind of gets soaked with water and then they pull it out and and that's intended to keep the wound um, fresh like it keeps kind of I, I don't even fully understand it it because it kind of reopens it a little bit but it's to keep mm-hmm. uh, probably to keep it from getting infected um, yeah. and it's horrible I mean it's horrible and I think that you know that was a, a ward of mostly young navy men who were the patients and I bet they learned words from me <laughs> that they'd never heard in their lives <laughs> And you had to do that, did you say twice a day? Yeah, it was twice a day. For three months? I, you know, well, the thing about the how long it lasted is I don't know if it was the whole three months. I yeah. I don't, you know, it's like the trauma sort of erases some of those memories. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if it happened for two weeks, for a month. Uh, your dad would probably remember better than I would. Than I would. Because that's where I met him, as you know. Like, do, do they still do that procedure? Or is that something that is, like, outdated now? I no yeah, idea. I don't either. I mean, I would imagine that there are less painful ways to do it now, but maybe with lasers or um, mm-hmm. other ways to make that wound heal more quickly. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. That sounds so horrible. <laughs> it was horrible. It was horrible. But I will say, um, you know, one thing it was, you know, that was a very long three months, but I'm super mm-hmm. grateful that it took so long. And I'd be interested in your perspective on this, Wifey, because for me... I think if if I had woken up, you know, in the hospital immediately and my and they had already amputated my leg, I mm-hmm. I feel like that three months was a chance to adjust my mind to the idea of mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. rather than just the shock of it's gone and you know no time to mentally prepare for it. Yeah, yeah. And in your case, I mean, that was it was more like that for you, right? I mean, it was instantaneous. Right. I mean. Yes and no. It was more like okay, I had the accident, and um, like I think they they didn't tell me for a week what really got lost because they tried to salvage as much as possible. Um, and since it was really dirty there, because it was like a machine, and and uh, yeah, a lot of dirt got into the wound. It wasn't really clear what they could salvage, and always also my skin was completely removed from the hand. So they at first obviously they tried to put the skin on that was ripped got ripped off and 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 tried to see okay how much skin was actually uh basically reattaching itself um but i didn't know i think for a week um what really got lost and up to this point i still like had this idea in my mind that every finger was there um which is uh, weird because they knew that they amputated already um because in the papers it said basically on the next day that mm-hmm. uh, my fingers got amputated, mm. all of them. So everyone else knew before you knew. Yeah, that um, they were amputated. Yeah, so I don't know what was the choice to let me wait, uh, but yeah, once I found out, I mean, yeah, it was pretty like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I did not have like a <laughs> an adjustment period or something, and it felt like I I tried to to compare it to to losing something either like a loved one or like family member or something like that because that's how it felt to me it was the same the same sadness and frustration uh of losing something that you you know that was there all the time i don't know how it felt to you because you you made the conscious choice to say goodbye to your leg yeah but I, for me it's that that was the feeling that that i had for like months yeah I mean, that's a great way to describe it is like losing losing a family member or, or somebody very important to you because it's it's interesting um, to look at your own body and and it, it's not your body anymore. It doesn't, you know, it's mm-hmm. I, it's so hard to describe how that feels. Like this is not yep. this is unrecognizable. Yep. I used to be able to look down and this is what I look like and who I am. And then suddenly yep. you're dramatically different and you're dramatically different in a way that not only is hard for you to accept, but you know from your own personal experience of looking at others before this happened to you, looking at others mm-hmm. who have had something like that happen. And, you know, it's hard for the brain to adjust because yep. Yep. the brain expects things to be symmetrical and to look a certain way. And, uh, I, there was a study once about uh, babies where they showed 
that babies are more attracted at a very early age to a more symmetrical face. So they, there's mm-hmm. a different reaction from infants when they're looking at a person whose face is more symmetrical. Uh, and I think that's, you know, like, where does that even come from that that's, that's how we process and what we mm-hmm. want to see? <laughs> I mean, uh, how was it for you? A, bi- a big thing for me was, I rem- I mean, over the, the, the course of the hospital stay and, and also later, uh, they took away stuff from my hand. Um, like at the beginning, I had still like, I think most of my thumb, thumb but they had to take it off completely because they reattached the, the, the toes. But how was it for you? Like the... Because my big thing was when I was in the hospital and I remembered it vividly, I always thought like, where are, what are they going to do with all the stuff that basically they had to cut off? Because that's something they just throw away and, and like <laughs> getting, I don't know, the, the thought that, that like a body part that I was using all the time and that was such a useful thing to me got just basically thrown into the, the garbage was so hard to adjust for me. I don't know why, but that was, that was hard. Uh, you know, th- th- it's interesting because my, I didn't really, I didn't really have that th- thought about it. And it might be, this is, this is really sick humor, but it, and, but it's also part of something I'm super grateful for, which is the people who were around me, uh, during that time. Um, so because I was there for three months And I couldn't sleep because you kind of sleep odd hours if you're laying. I couldn't get out of the hospital bed. I was in traction and couldn't move. I had to lay flat on my back for that whole time. And so your sleep pattern really gets weird. And, the, you know, because it was a naval hospital, the people who were taking care of me were corpsmen. And these are young men, for the most part, who are, you know, in their 20s. And they're, they're doing the night shift and they're bored. And my room became sort of like psychology central like they would come in and tell me their problems and sit in the chair and talk to me all hours of the night because (laughs) the hospital's not nothing's happening at night you know unless there's an occasional emergency Mm -hmm. situation for the most part they don't have much to do and here I am you know wide awake and somebody to talk to so I, 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 I developed some pretty really good relationships there and one of them uh his name was John was just funny as shit and in a really sick kind of humor that I like. And he started telling me uh, after the amputation, but before I got to go home, which was uh, a couple weeks before Christmas is I think when the amputation happened and I was going to be going home for Christmas. And John would come in my room and make jokes about how they had taken my leg to his house (laughs) And then it was gonna be, it was gonna be Christmas dinner. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and you know, for some reason, that helped me. Um, I, yeah, I don't know I why, because it was just gross, but it was just so funny to me. And it, if you knew him and you and you could see, I can't, I can't do it justice. How funny he was in his presentation of you know the details of how this was going to go. <laughs> mm. I mean, I can see that <laughs> humor helped me tremendously. Humor was the one thing that kept me going. And everyone uh, who visited me said, like, well, how, how are you able to laugh? How are you able to have fun? And I don't know, that was like the big thing for me that I just made fun of it most of the time. I mean, sure, there were the, the, the hard times and the sad times, but most of, most of the time I had a good time and it was a... It was part of the healing or at least of the adjusting to to like this new life kind of. Yeah. I don't know. I, makes sense. I, well, I think like um, that, that question happens so often, right? When people who haven't gone through it will say things like, um, oh, you're so brave or how do you keep laughing? Um, and, and, and I think that people who've gone through it understand something different about it, which is that before you've gone through it, it just feels like, I couldn't survive that. I would never be able to handle that. It would just be too much. And what you learn when you go through it is that we're all pretty strong, really. And you just adjust. It, it takes some time. But you you learn that you're still you. <laughs> you know, the essential you is still there. This is a physical part of you that's gone. But it doesn't change who you are. And I think sometimes the hardest thing is to convince other people that it doesn't make you not you, 
uh, or that you should somehow be dramatically different because you went through that. You know, sometimes I think it's harder for others to adjust to it than than it mm-hmm. was for you. Yeah, no, that's totally true. Um, I, I mean, uh, a, a big thing in that sense is that a lot of people who haven't had this like uh or like this traumatic event where something changed from one day to another if uh, like if it's someone like losing someone really close or or having an accident where life all of a sudden changed drastically or even like a a cancer or some really serious illness um uh, you're right uh, the first of all the human body is insane because it just you know goes through stuff and if you give it the proper time and and also, of course, the medical care, it just, it's fine at some point again. Um, but also the human mind, if you don't fall into a hole and if you just keep going, at some point you're back on your feet or mm-hmm. on one leg and it, it's just fine. It's fine. That's just how your life is. And the weird thing is over the like years, I mean, as you said, looking at your body and something is completely different. I had, I don't know, it took me like five years, I think, until I, I can, I was able to look at my hand and I was like, okay, that's me, that's my thing, that's my hand, and it's normal. Well, that kind of goes nicely into what I wanted to ask you, Mom, is like, a, um, I wouldn't say more on the darker side, but on more of the traumatic side of it, how, because now you have such a, I mean, you've always had such a good humor but and when you talk about it you talk about it so openly and i've seen you talk about it with complete strangers so openly um but after it happened how how was your like your mood and your overall mental health like was it fluctuating was it did you have like a darker period where it was really really hard or did you kind of have like a balance like from the start i i I I think I'm really fortunate just for the way the whole the circumstances that happened in the middle of this. Um, so your dad is one of them because um, I was uh, I was as a kid growing up. I had an older sister who was drop dead gorgeous and a younger brother who was super handsome. And I was a little homely. And, and in some pictures, I would say frightening. <laughs> not homely. What does that mean? Excuse me. No, I mean, I... I, I what yeah, mean? After, mo- after my mom. How, how would you describe homely? Voice is asking what the, what, what the word means. Um, like very plain, you know, nothing special to talk about. In some photos, just downright frightening because I was, uh-huh. I, <laughs> I was, I was very much a tomboy, and I just didn't care about how I looked. And um, I had really fine hair, so my mom would never let me grow it long. She thought when I grew it long, it just looked stringy, so she kept it really short. <laughs> so I kind of looked like a boy. I dressed like a boy. And if you look at some of the pictures of me and my siblings, it's like just gorgeous little boy, beautiful little girl. And what the heck is that thing in the center? The thing, the thing that I think was your, the only thing that I think was your downfall, because I think you're a gorgeous woman, but your hair, you had this perm thing that was absolutely horrifying yes it was yes it was and i mean i oh gosh when i lived in philadelphia when that was the thing i mean oh i, I look at those pictures and I'm like, what the heck were you thinking that did not work for you honey <laughs> but your dad okay, had it sorry we interrupted too. did you yeah, know that we interrupted your yes i have seen i've seen those lovely pictures <laughs> <laughs> so all that to say, I had a very low self-image, um, and I um, was very conscious of that. Like I wanted to be seen as you know pretty, attractive, and so to to have that sort of self-image already, and then to lose a limb and being a female, you know, I mean I don't mean to say it's worse for a girl than a boy, but physical appearances seem to have a little bit more um, are given more attention with women, and so to also have done that. Um, that probably was the biggest struggle at the beginning, but where I got fortunate is that um, I met your dad, and you know to have somebody attracted to you in the middle of going through that, you know to mm-hmm. see you 
and um, mm-hmm. to you know that's not even a factor. The fact that you don't have a leg is not even a factor. Uh, and mm-hmm. so I was lucky because you know how early love is, right? You're just like that's it. There's nothing else in the world. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it, that's what he said too. That's what he said too he, when he was on the pod. Did you listen to that episode with him on? Uh, which which one? What, what was the title of it? Oh. Uh, about breakups, what about breakups, breakups can teach yeah. you. Oh, yeah, right. Yes, I did. Yeah. And he was talking about how he's, that's how he is a lot, or especially how he was with, with women. He would meet somebody, and ever since he was, like, a teenager, he would meet this girl. They'd go out a little bit, and he'd be like, this is the girl <laughs> I'm going to marry. And it was always that for him, which I just <laughs> find so lovely and sweet. But But it is true, right? When you're in that stage... That that's your whole world. I mean, it's like everything else is kind of like peripheral. It just doesn't matter. So that helped me. I'm not really sure. I I suspect that uh, I would have had a, a significantly darker period of time because I lived in a town. Ta- if I didn't have that hope, um, because I lived in a town where um, uh, I I don't want to be cruel, but it was kind of hillbilly. And women were sort of uh, just not respected as much as you might see in other places. You were, um, it wasn't, it wasn't about, it, are you funny or are you smart? It was just, are, are you pretty? And I know that's kind of everywhere, but it, where I grew up, I think it was emphasized a little bit more. And so I think if I hadn't had something hopeful, like, like your dad, um, I, and then I'm back home, which is an hour away from where I met him, you know, back in my town of that kind of thinking it would have been much more difficult it would have been horrible mm-hmm. <laughs> i mean there um i want to just quickly go back to the like surviving something that is so dramatic or horrible because i read a book a couple of months ago called the man's search for meaning by victor frankel um and he he was a, a jew during um the second world war um and he survived concentration camp um, and he wrote a book about it and he basically wrote why he survived it or basically his foundings because he's like a, a psychotherapist and he he worked through all the trauma and all the stuff that happened um, by writing the book. Was he a psychotherapist? Yeah, yeah, before, he, yeah. Before? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh-huh, that's interesting. Yeah, so he, he, was, he wasn't able to flee. So he he got uh, into the concentration camp and he got, got into the worst one in, in, in Auschwitz, to Auschwitz. Mm-hmm. Um, and he saw all of those people dying because they, not because they, they were sick necessarily or because they um, were treated so horribly, but because they lost uh, the, 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 will? the will. They lost yeah. the, the, the power of just going, just keep moving. Um, and it's funny because he, uh, his only thing was, I want to see my family again, even though he didn't really know if they made it. He didn't know if they were still alive. But that was his thing that kept him going, and it was just like the will of, 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 yeah, I'm, I can survive this. I'm going to survive this. Um, and it's so interesting because um, he he also talks about this, like because they took everything from them, they had nothing. Um, but it's so interesting because with all the the, I don't want to get political, but with all the stuff that's happening right now with the freedom, you can't take away like my freedom by forcing a mask upon me and stuff like that it's so it's so stupid because um we are talking about like being free and living this free world and stuff like that but we we literally don't know what it means (laughs) um and when you like put the whole thing in perspective and when you read his book and his Mm -hmm. lines and he he basically said they 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 took everything but they couldn't take the will they couldn't take the the be him being free of like uh, uh, hunting after that that thought of seeing his family again, that's like something that that's true free. Uh, f- that's like that that's true. I don't freedom. know freedom. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's hope, right? Hope is such a powerful force if you think about right. it, and that's what he had. That's what I had. Right. And if you have, you know, it would be interesting to figure out, you know, how do you how do you create hope? 
for somebody who mm. doesn't have it. Like, had I gone back and not met Joe and didn't have that to look forward to, and I'm in this small town living with my parents, how does one yeah. create hope? Yeah, mm. yeah. That's interesting. But I, I, I want to keep going because I'm really interested in, like, you um, lost your leg and then you at some point got pregnant for the first time and I'm just super interested in how that went and if there were any like because when you think about I mean like any person who has two healthy legs and hands getting pregnant is already a big thing but like if you have only like if you have such a big handicap how do you like if there well, is especially with all the extra like added weight right. that you're carrying right. and then you have you're balancing them on one leg and crutches yeah. just everything and then that like, whole experience is how, how was that how was that in terms of like preparing for that and was it like scarier or did it seem scarier to you or did you just like went with it and then i don't know i i feel like i just kind of went with it um you know You know this, Wifey, you, you know, I was like you. I would say, like, for the first couple of years, I couldn't look at my limb and like it or be okay with it. It was kind of, I was repulsed by it for a while. And then you reach a point where you're like, this is just me, right? And that was true with pregnancy, too. I didn't feel like being pregnant in my condition was any different than it would have otherwise been I mean certainly more hurdles <laughs> um because I um I didn't uh, I didn't get a leg I mean I, I was offered a leg right after I got out of the hospital and, and healed for a bit but um this you'll like this wifey at that time um the only option that I had was this leg that uses it's like a vacuum effect and so what it is is there's just a hollow part of the upper thigh of this leg that you put on And you wrap your residual limb in this um, uh, ace bandage, basically, from the top of the limb all the way down to the bottom. And you leave a piece. You put it in the leg and you pull a little bit of that ace bandage out through a hole, if you can picture that. It's sort of like where the leg hits the knee. And then you have mm -hmm. to pull, 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 pull until the whole thing comes off. And it creates a suction effect that oh. then makes that oh cling to you. But uh -huh. if you... So you're doing all this standing up, and then you sit down, and when you sit down, a little bit of air gets into the leg from <laughs> your buttock area, <laughs> and then when you stand up, you then push that air <laughs> out of the bottom of the leg. <laughs> oh, nice. You're an 18-year-old girl, and you're making sounds like that when you get up out of a chair. <laughs> It was the chair. Right. Well, the funny <laughs> that thing wasn't is, me. The funny thing is, like when I, I was talking to the therapist about it and saying, you know, I don't want to wear this leg anymore because, you know, it makes these sounds. And they were like, and I was like, what if I, you know, I'm getting on a bus and I take that first step up and all of a sudden just this big blat and everybody on the bus and he's like, well, just explain it. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to make an announcement. Excuse me, everybody on this bus. But that wasn't actually a <laughs> fart, even though it sounded like a very loud, realistic <laughs> fart. It was just my leg. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. I rejected that, um, and I went. I went for I think it was 17 years that I was on crutches. Both pregnancies, I was on crutches. Um, I feel like it wasn't insane. until I was like seven or eight or something that you got a prosthetic leg. Yeah, you were. You were the first time I got one. Uh, you were probably two, maybe two, because that's that was what drove me to do it. Is I've got a toddler and an infant, and I'm on crutches, and that mm -hmm. was really hard. You know, trying to hold his yeah, hand. Yeah. And keep my crutches tucked under my armpit so that I could, it was. It looked ridiculous trying if you were trying to walk with the two of you. Um, yeah. And the, so I did try again, and that didn't work out so well. And then I think it was. You're probably right. You were probably six or seven when I tried again and finally found a good solution. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was the, the probably Wifey, The hardest thing was you know we uh, in the winter time. You know, I'm still going to work every day. And when it would get icy and you're pregnant and on crutches, that was probably what I would say was the scariest bit thing about being pregnant with those circumstances. Um, and one of my favorite stories, I'm kind of ranting on, but one of my favorite stories is for both pregnancies. Um, I had a homeless person point to my tummy and tell me, 
first time, oh, yeah. that's a boy. And then the second one said that's a girl. And that particular situation was um, it had it was a bad snow and ice storm. We were in Washington, D.C. And I went to work anyway. And I came up off of the escalator, which just comes up onto a sidewalk. And then I had a long downhill from that top of the escalator to get to my office. And the sidewalks are a sheet of ice. And I start trying to do it. And I'm big. I'm, you know, pretty big. Maybe this was Zach because that would have been... Yeah, that might have been Zach. So I guess I have to take that back. That wasn't you. That was that was Zach, the Zach story. But the person um, at the bottom of the hill is a homeless guy. And he sees me trying to start making my way down this hill. And, he's, and I stop about halfway and I decide I'm not doing this. I'm going to go back home. So I start to turn around and he goes, hold on, hold on. And he catches up with me <laughs> and he helps me the rest of the way until I got back on the escalator. And so he was the boy one because that couldn't have been you in, in winter. And he's like, that is a boy. That is a boy. <laughs> um, but uh, taking it further, like, because I had, um, the weird thing is I didn't, I, I adjusted myself and everything, but I never really worked through the trauma of the whole accident of everything that happened. Because right after you're kind of like left alone with your thoughts and trying to figure out how life moves on and how to adjust to that and what comes next. And with all my operations and I guess with your physical therapies and everything that came afterwards, you basically took it step by step, I assume. And you didn't like, I don't know, waste any time to like think about everything that happened, try to work through all of the trauma. But did like the, the trauma catch you at some point or do you still feel sometimes there is still something left that is part of that or, or stems from that? I think for me, and this is this is why I had, t I had mentioned earlier why it, how I wonder how it might be different for you and I to have that time to prepare yourself for this to happen versus to just be shocked by it immediately with no time to emotionally prepare yourself for this change. And I I really do. I'm I'm so grateful that I had those three months because. I think I spent those three months preparing myself for, for this. This is probably going to happen. And I didn't have yeah. that shock of it. Um, and, and it was a decision. I mean, that's huge. Mm -hmm. it, was, yeah. it was a decision that I made. I had some say in it. I didn't have something yeah. just taken from me, you know, with no say. I think, you know, that makes a huge, a huge difference in how it is. So I would say that I have fleeting trauma um, that is not significant. It's more those moments where you almost cry because you wish you could run again. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, yeah, running yeah. is... I was, I was one of the fastest kids in my class in elementary school, and I was so proud of that. Because I was very competitive, and I wanted to be—I wanted to beat the boys more than anything. Because I grew up in a household where, um, at least, my father said girls had limited value, <laughs> and uh, most of it had to do with you know their value to a man, um, and and that that bothered me a lot, and it made me want to be better than men. <laughs> And one of the ways that at that age that I was able to accomplish that was, was running faster than any of them. And I just loved it. I loved it when I beat the boys. Um, and, and I loved running. And I miss it. I, I miss it. Um, and I don't like... Uh, part of that competitiveness also is that it makes me feel like so discouraged sometimes when I can't do something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I get that. I get that feeling. It's, it's so frustrating. Yeah. Or I can't do it well. Or I, um, you know, one thing, so you said something earlier, Wifey, about just the, the body and how it adjusts itself. And one thing I've learned and really learned to appreciate about the human body is just how perfect it is. It's so perfect. And you really understand that when you start wearing a prosthetic leg because technology is pretty good, but, you know, the leg. You, you don't have an ankle that can shift with an uneven terrain, right? And so 
Try walking one time where you're walking on a slope where the right side of you is higher than the left side of you, and then try to keep your left leg and ankle stiff. Cannot bend beyond a certain point, and you'll you'll appreciate just how perfect the body is, how it adjusts to those things. You're, you don't even have to think about it. It just happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's evolution. That's insane. You can't... I mean, they're pretty, pretty good already with, like, the, mm -hmm. the latest technology that nobody can afford. Right. <laughs> but And at some point, it will probably get affordable. But still, I mean, my options when I when I was at the hospital, they told me they can basically get rid of the whole hand that is left and I can get, like, a pr prosthetic hand. And I probably would have gotten a really good one. Or they said we can reattach two toes and you have, like, a grip. Um, but the thing is with the prosthetic, you, you have no feeling in it. Mm. I mean, sure. There are some prosthetics already. They can like with like, uh, some electric waves or something they can stim, they can and simulate, the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the feeling like in the fingers and, and also in the, the leg, but it's not the same. And that was my main thing. And also my doctor said, if you can't feel anything, it's so hard to, To make the connection that it's your hand. Right, and also mm -hmm. to use it properly. So it would never be as good as the two fingers that are able to feel. Mm. Would it have been something that they actually connected to you physically? Or was it something you would take off take off and on? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how that... I think, I think they're both. But I probably would have gotten one that can be uh, attached removed. and removed. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I would say with my leg, I don't consider the prosthetic leg really. I appreciate it, but it doesn't feel like a part of me. And in some yeah. ways, it feels very traitorous because <laughs> it, yeah. it buckles unexpectedly. I don't trust it. I don't trust it for the most part. Um, so that's and I, you know, I, I think if, if I had been in your situation, I would have probably made that same choice better to have, um, you know, feeling there. Yeah, yeah. And also I didn't want to get rid of something that was still fine. Right. Do you do you still feel your other fingers? S sometimes. I mean, he tells me like It's pretty rare. that in terms of feet, like he he can still move his fingers, yeah, like yeah. all of his fingers in his hand he can still move them as if they were like the like the actual the knuckles. finger yeah, the knuckles. So he moves that as if he's moving his fingers. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, occasionally you have like phantom pains in my, but mostly in my leg where they they took the way the the mm -hmm. two uh, the toes. Skin. Oh, and oh yeah, and the toes. That's where sometimes I have like an itch on my toe, and I try to itch it, and yeah. then it's not possible, and then <laughs> oh yeah, it's the one missing one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's rare. Do you have phantom pains at all? I mean, so that's a phantom sensation, but do you ever have pain? No, no. Thankfully, I did never had really. I think at the beginning a little bit like. I mean, you had some when I first came here, but it was more like spasms than pain. Yeah, but it wasn't really pain. It was never like where it really hurt or where it was super painful. Thankfully, I've um, I've read a little bit about that because I do have those, um, and they can be really pretty horrible sometimes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, that's another thing that's just fascinating about the human brain because one of the things that I read about that is that somebody who had a prolonged period of trauma before the amputation versus somebody who had immediate, the, the person mm -hmm. who had prolonged is more likely to have the phantom pains. And they think that it might be because your brain has an associated, a learned pain pattern mm -hmm. um, oh, sure. over that period of time that didn't happen when it was more instantaneous. Uh, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I learned some really fascinating things about phantom pains in college when i was studying psychology oh look at you fancy huh? <laughs> college <girl. laughs> yeah. the college that i dropped out of and <laughs> and but we learned some really fascinating things about phantom pains and how some people deal with them and some of the things are so crazy because it's ways to trick your brain mm -hmm. essentially where some people it's as simple as like they use a mirror and I they like put the a mirror, mirror trick, yeah. in between so like say it's your leg you put a mirror in between where like in the center of your legs yeah. and so then it looks like you have two legs so if you look at the mirror long enough you're looking at two legs yeah. and you can trick your brain yeah. into thinking oh there's a leg there i'm fine that works uh, that worked for me at least or mm -hmm. there was one that and this one i see as work like it would work but 
knowing just from you, mom, how expensive the just the foot part of the prosthetic leg is, I would never do this. <laughs> but they, there are some people who, with especially with that kind of a, a limb loss, they literally put the prosthetic leg on. They're staring at their feet. They take a knife and they stab Weirder. their prosthetic foot. Because then it makes the association with your brain, oh, this isn't real. I That's not really my foot. Real foot. I don't feel that. Wow. <laughs> I stab the real foot. But I was like, that's really cool that you can trick your brain. But on the other side, I'm like, I know how expensive those are. So who is just going to stab it? True. But I do have leftover feet in my closet. So oh, I can just there take you go. leftover those feet. Ones. It's worth You time. should try it sometime. See if it works. I uh, you know, I I I I saw the mirror one. Um, I I read about that one, and first thing I thought is that I wonder how flexible your mind needs to be for that to work. Because when I was in the hospital for those three months, they I was on a lot of pain medication, and they really wanted to try to wean me off of it. So they experimented with um, hypnosis. Uh, was the first thing they did. And um, then also, you're probably familiar with this, Danny, because I, I bet you did it with massage stuff, but it's um, um, acupuncture, but, but electronic acupuncture, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. they send pulses in your palm. I think it's like your right palm affects your left leg or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and neither of those worked for me. The, the hypnosis was, you know, the whole time that he's trying to do it, I'm just in my head saying, I'm not going to let this work. <laughs> Because I want those pain meds. <laughs> no, sure. no, but the mirror thing, I think I did it once because it w it happened on accident, weirdly, because we had this mirror um, in this one room and I walked into the room and it happened on accident. It looked like I had still a, uh, like a right hand um, and it worked like instantly huh. it's weird how you can trick the brain with uh, the brain with that mm -hmm. i never did it when i had like like spasms or anything but i can totally see that working mm -hmm. i should definitely try that no harm um, um i would just like to i've been a little more silent on this episode because i don't relate personally as much as the two of you do and also you're the co-host danielle yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I want to just take a minute to kind of talk both of you up a little bit because, Mom, on your side of it, I mean, since I was a kid, I have insanely admired you for everything that you did when I was, I mean, now, especially looking back, I mean, when you're so young, you don't quite recognize it for what it is, but as I aged and as I got older, I, I really looked back and I was like, that she's like fucking Wonder Woman. <laughs> and anytime that I talk to people about you, even now, that's how I refer to you. I say that you're like Wonder Woman because I don't know, I don't know how you did all of the things that you did and how you had the humor that you had. I mean, when we were kids, you used to like make your your leg talk. <laughs> 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 like where the where the scar is it was like the mouth that. and she would like make a talk oh my god <laughs> and it was just <laughs> but the crazy thing is to us that was that yeah. was normal you know yeah. that it was so normalized in our family that that was like something for i'm sure this bothered you at some point but when we were kids zach and i would have friends over and we would be like make the leg talk because for us it was so normal and the kids and were so like completely <laughs> horrified and <laughs> and traumatized they came home like Honey, what happened? She 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 made the leg talk. <laughs> right. <laughs> How many people and, still have nightmares? Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> it but, still haunts them. <laughs> but I think that that made it was so it's such a lovely way to to grow up like in that environment and with somebody who's been through something that you've been through to grow up with such a positive influence with it and i mean i think you had told me this mom at some point when i was like six or seven or something i told you that when i grow up i want to have one leg just like you oh my gosh i'll, I'll never forget that moment i can remember where we were like if, you know how you have those visual memories where you know exactly the place yeah. that you were when it happened but you just turned to me one day and i think you were like maybe four and you said, Mommy, 
when I'm a lady, I'm going to have one leg too. Like it was the best thing ever. When I'm a lady. <laughs> when I'm a lady. <laughs> but then, I mean, that just goes to show you like how how much I admired you and how much like you made it seem almost like I mean fun is a weird way to describe it but that's kind of, it was just your humor about it and your the way that you kind of expressed yourself and just the person that you were was so admirable and I I continue to see that as I get older with all of your travels and mm. climbing Machu Picchu and yep. just these things that that really really amaze me and I I feel very very fortunate to have you as a as a mom Oh, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> That's very sweet. But I also said I would talk you up for a second because I don't I, like that. But I, I want to just tell you, too, that that's also something I really admire about you because I've seen where you've come. And I also knew from the start that you and my mom would get along because I think you oh, have. Right. Oh, we don't. <laughs> we really don't. It's all a sham. It's all a show. Especially when he calls me pap smear. Pap smear patty. <laughs> you told us that it's fine with you. <laughs> no, but I really admire you too, and I I am so proud of the the person that you've become, and and going through something that you went through, and to to come out of it on this side, even having to deal with the aftermath and having to deal with the trauma, kind of catching up to you. I watched you go through that, and I watched you conquer so many struggles and, and emotions and fears and you I think you handled it so beautifully and I don't know I'm I'm just very I'm very proud of you no, that's, that's really yeah. nice thank you yeah. I mean as your mom said I think you just take on the challenge and because what's the what's the the other you can't do anything else otherwise you would just you know die at <laughs> some point <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I mean it's, that's true. The alternative it, is, is, is much worse yeah. when you think about yeah. it. Mm. And I think life is so beautiful besides all the the hardship that happens sometimes. I don't know. And also, I think for me, at least when I, when I did uh, rehabilitation at this hospital or at this center, I saw a lot of worse things or at least uh, comparably. Um, and that also puts things into perspective to see like uh, young people who can't walk anymore or who are completely paralyzed, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, I don't know. And also for me, at least, I saw people without like basically right after uh, they're losing their leg from accidents or whatever. And we talked and it's funny because they said, oh, thank God I lost the leg. I would never be able to lose a hand. And I said, oh, thank God I lost my hand because I... <laughs> like to walk and stuff like that so it's it's funny that that um i don't know it's it, it just puts it into perspective what other people go through and you seem like okay um if they can do that or if they they can handle that amount of shit i can handle amount my i can handle my amount of shit somehow i don't know no, i think that's exactly right and i mean just the the contrast you made earlier between you know, somebody who suffered through Auschwitz and we've got people today who can't even wear mm. a mask to help others for a minute, yeah. you know, uh, the yeah. appreciation that you get from any trauma, right? Any any yeah. difficulty you've gone through in your life is going to help you, at least in that area, to appreciate and empathize with others and uh, appreciate, be grateful that you got through it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Not that totally. actually, what you just said answers the question that I was going to ask you. So unless you have something to add to the question I'm about to ask, um, but I was going to ask you if you had any anything, like any words of advice or something to give to somebody who might be listening who is going through some sort of trauma or who has had a trauma similar in that sense where they lost a limb or they had a bad accident or something that they're dealing with in that regard um, to like get through it and, and know that things are going to be okay essentially. And you kind of answered it with what you just said, but I don't know if you have maybe something to add on to it. I think, I think I would say that, um, it's, it's really easy in the beginning. It's really easy to think that you're not you anymore and people will stare 
and that that affects you, right? I'm not me. People didn't used to stare at me, and now people stare at me. You have to you have to come to terms with what Wifey and I both talked about, which is first, it's you learning to accept the new you. You look down and you're repulsed by it because you know it's just how we're taught to see what the human body looks like. So it takes a while to reach your own personal acceptance and just to know that, that it's going to take some time, but you will get there. And then it's going to take some time to accept the way other people see you, especially at first. That was difficult for me because it was the first time in my life where when I first met somebody, their first impression was my disability because it was, it was so visible. It was the first thing that they saw. And it's a, it's a matter of teaching yourself that that's not about you. It's about them. And it's not because there's something wrong with them. It's just not common to see. And yeah. you don't know how to react. And so you almost feel like at some point, like, I need to help them. It, you know, I need to help them to overcome their thing. Because <laughs> yeah. this is not yeah. my thing. Um and when you start seeing yourself that way, it actually helps you to not be a victim of the thing, but a person who might be able to help them to overcome something that, that they're actually struggling with. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I would say, and then hope, you know, going back to the whole hope thing, it, it's set a goal for yourself and, and, and move toward that and hope toward that because that's what sort of drives life. You know, having something yeah. that you're looking to looking toward. No matter how big or how small, it really makes a huge difference. And yeah, that's love true. yourself. You didn't change, right? You're you. That's true. And I think it's I mean, we talked about this multiple times in the other episodes, but every every shit that life throws at you, it's a chance to grow and learn. Mm-hmm. And to to, I don't know, essentially get stronger. It's dumb. It's yeah. like this dumb saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But but it's true. But it's I mean, kind of true because... It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity, yes. And if you if you use it right, then you will grow from it. No question. And, and it's funny how much we all resist change. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. sort of like, I just ate a salad and I'm like, why don't I eat a salad every day? It's so good. <laughs> and it's the same with change, right? You resist it, but almost every time you go through change, something positive happens you learn something yeah, you true. grow in some way yeah that's true and i, I mean I, we preach that I, at least i do if you stop changing you basically start dying yes if you if i mean if humanity would have said at some point we stop evolving then we would have probably stopped i don't know like a thousand years ago or more we we didn't stop and we don't stop and there i hate when people Every age say, oh, I'm just so old, I can't do that anymore. Or, or you know, I've done that all like this all the time. I, I don't mm-hmm. want to change that habit now. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's or just the wrong. it's too late to change right? it now. It's the wrong. And my grandma is 90 and she changed so much in the last 30 years I've known her. It's insane. She's a completely yeah, she's different person. She's a great person. example of that. Being and she, 90 right. and being so like accepting of yeah. so many yeah. things that people her age would never be right. accepting she's of. She's like she's like the most open person I know and she's 90 and she's seen the worst stuff but she never stopped changing and learning and educating herself. It's just I don't know, that's my thing. My best my my best memory of her is just how courageous she is too because that's one thing a lot of people the reason that they don't accept change is cuz they're afraid of change, right? Um, or fearful of whatever. And in her case, like what I loved that she did when I was there for your wedding is even though she you know, didn't speak English and I didn't speak German, she didn't, she wasn't afraid to just talk to me. She just came to yeah. me and talked to me. And I think uh, your mom probably was the one who was helping me to understand what she was yeah. saying, but she looked me in the eye and I could tell that she was saying her most sincere thoughts to me. And it just felt so yeah. nice because so many people will avoid having that moment because they don't want to feel foolish and that, you know, they yeah. know I don't understand and it's awkward. Or but they talk had... directly to the person that that's yeah. going to translate right, to you. Right. So they don't talk to you. They yeah. talk to the person who they know understands. Right. But it was that's like true. she embraced having that moment with me. And I just thought that was really, really beautiful. Yeah. 
one last question, and it's a serious one. <laughs> oh, no, it's going to be about I know it's about poop. It? Uh, it, it is actually because for me a big thing was going to the toilet it completely changed after my accident how I went to the toilet and it's just it's kind of a dumb question but if something really life changing happens just the smallest little things mm -hmm. like your habits that you've been doing all those years the same way like brushing your teeth going to the toilet etc stuff like that might change and just, so my question is like did like going to the toilet change for you <laughs> um if you're a female and you're going to the bathroom in a public toilet, you generally will not let your ass sit on the toilet. You'll yeah. hold yourself yep. up above it. I can't, I can't do that. Um, so that definitely mm. changed. And then here's a funny one. When we were in China, uh, the, I think all but one <laughs> toilet that we encountered was the kind that's yep. just oh, no. on, you know, flat on the ground. It's a hole in the floor. Oh, yep. no. <laughs> And that was lovely to learn. I can't squat. You know, my, my left leg, you know, it, it, it will bend in a certain yeah. way, but it's very stiff. And if you try to get in a squatting position, it's not possible. So the only way I could squat was to have that leg fully extended in front of me and then have my right leg, my, my real leg, do all of the work to do that. Oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> so there are, yeah, there are weird things like that that... Um, I mean, now they've See, got we, those, we those both girl have... things that I wish we'd known about then. What are they called? Like yeah. uh, shiwi? Yeah. <laughs> that would have been sweet. We we both had very the unique experiences with those toilets in China because you had to learn how to squat with one leg and I had my first period with those. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, and then there's also China. the story when we were in the Mojave Desert and I didn't know anyone was around and I just went to, Danielle and oh, yeah. I went to go to the bathroom in the outhouse. We were at a campground and it was filled with these gross bugs and so neither mm. of us wanted to go in there. So I just went so out gross. into sort of the desert stuff away from the campground and I just stood and peed like a man. And um, I, I shouted back to my family that I said, I'm man peeing in the Mojave. And <laughs> little did I know that these other campers had come in during the time that I was walking out there. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so good. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I, Voifi actually got me one of those little cup things yeah, for women to pee when standing. you're out in nature. Yeah. But I haven't used it yet because, one, I don't know if I'm comfortable enough yet to use that. But, two, we also haven't really gone on a long enough adventure mm. where I would need to use it. Yeah. But is it the kind? I'm still excited about it. Yeah, I know. I mean, if you ever, if you just go to the Shiwi website and look at their, just the commercials on the site, it's like, this is a group of women who are like, I, they've wanted their whole lives to man pee. You can tell by watching them. They're totally into it. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it's, it's from the, the military. I think the military. Yeah, they designed in, it. They designed really? it for women. Yeah, yeah. For women to pee faster in like war situations. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. So sometimes war is good for something, I guess. <laughs> it's great for prosthetics. <laughs> that's, that's true. true. So I think that's that's I think that's, that's a good where we will blah, blah, where we will end it. Okay. Well, I was so yeah. nervous was about doing this, but it wasn't it wasn't as scary as I expected. Good. Yeah. It was really nice talking to you. You too, as always. And um, for the for the listener, you actually lucked out because normally. Thankfully, Voifi is here to look at the time because when my mom and I talk, <laughs> most of the time we say, I need to call you really quick, but only for like 10 minutes. Right. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I only have a few minutes anyways. And, and it, that like turns into hours. three hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Every time. Never fails. <laughs> and there we are, are like incapable in the of a 10-minute conversation. And in the middle of that, there's like at least 10, okay, this is really the last thing and then we need to, we need to hang up. <laughs> Or one more, one more side story, and then by the end of it, we forgot why we called yeah. each other in the first place. All I hear is a... <laughs> no, but it's really nice. I like when you talk to your mom. Because then you have some free time for three no, hours. No, but it's, it makes you happy, and I like hearing you happy, because you're never wow. happy here. So Yeah, it's true. I don't like you very much. It's understandable. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so I think I should go now. I love you guys. <laughs> we love you we too. We love you too. 
And thanks for thanks for doing the podcast with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, listeners. Well, we are very thankful for all of you who are yeah, listening. It was a little longer this time. Um, but I think very interesting and informative. Yeah. And uh, please share if you like what you hear. Please uh, follow or subscribe and give us a rating on Apple and Stitcher podcast That's pos- if that's possible. And please, no one has done this yet. And we keep telling you guys to oh, do send it. Us a message but on, yeah, send us a message on, on Anchor. Anchor. Yep. And then we'll play it on the podcast. It'll be really you fun. You can talk about poop. Right. Talk. Give us like your funniest poop story. <laughs> Or scariest poop story? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Are there scary poop stories? Yeah, like if if, if there's blood involved, <laughs> okay, it can be scary. It's a little serious. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Okay. So, yeah, but other than that, thank you for listening, and we see, hear each other the next time. Okay. Bye. Bye.